Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Oh, yeah, folks, it is that time once again. Monday evening right here in downtown Moriarty, New Mexico. It's 7 p.m. out there on the East Coast, 5 p.m. right here. And uh, you can figure out the times for yourselves on the rest of your zones. <laughs> oh, boy, uh, Cowboy Tech's asking me, what are we having from leftovers? Well, I got quite the, quite the menu lined up for you. All right. Uh, anyway, this is the Grim Leftovers program. I am Grimnir. And uh, we are live right here on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz, as well as on freedomsnetwork.com, realliberty.org, tunein.com, internet radio, shoutcast, all kinds of places. Yep, it will be in more places after the show, because I post it up, like, everywhere, everywhere that I desire, anyway. So, uh, welcome to everybody out there in all the various spots you may be listening from. But if you're not here in the chat, come on over, reallibertymedia.com, jump on into the chat, and you can talk to the fine folks that are here this evening. And I just uh, tell you what I see uh, here in in the chat, people chatting it up. I see Frumpy, I see Sock Puppet, I see SLC Mike and Rob Works, I see Duh as Coley, Colby, Yerg. I don't know how he says that, Colby, Yerg. Vinny, Vincent Easley, the mysterious Vincent, Vanna White. I don't see Don, oh, Donna's, Donna's around somewhere, I'm sure. We got the Mighty Moose Girl, the Mighty Awesome Moose Girl there. Uh, I'm looking, there's Christine jumping on in. Hey, Christine, how you doing? All right, uh, <laughs> and uh, I don't know who else is around out there, but howdy to y'all. Whoever's listening in that I didn't mention, welcome, 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 welcome. Oh, Cowboy Tech, did I forget Cowboy Tech? Cowboy Tech. Moriarty does have a downtown. Cole uh, duh, is asking me, yeah. Yeah, and, and I live in the middle of the downtown area of Moriarty. Yes, and dude, and dude I deed. Indeed, I dude. <laughs> oh, do I have anything to tell you about? Yes, I do. The, uh, the, the, the fundraiser, uh, for those of you that might have missed out on the Freaker's Ball or Hal's show yesterday, the fundraiser was a success. We have reached our funding goals to keep everything up and running. However, however, if you would like to contribute, you still can um, because all any extra monies go to various things that uh, I may need to purchase throughout the year. But uh, absolutely thank you to all of the people. And it was a pretty good list of people that donated, that, that sent in some cash. So appreciate all of that uh, from everybody out there in all the various places. So, uh, yeah, I think that's good on that. Um, but, yeah, we'll be uh, doing the, the normal fundraiser drive throughout the rest of the month. Um, we may change it next next year to do it uh, from the middle of January to the middle of February. But uh, as it has been tradition over the many years, uh, February is the, the year. So, anyway... Uh, Keep that in mind, and there's other ways to contribute. You can do a show right here on reallibertymedia.com. That's a great contribution. Uh, you can buy stuff through our Amazon link right there. Uh, we have some other things on there that you could purchase. A VPN service is a great service I use. Uh, Private Internet Access, PIA, that's terrific. Uh, if you need some smoking accessories, uh, you can go through grass, our Grass City link there. Um, uh, there's some some uh, domain registration and website uh, hosting things you can click there. All kinds of stuff. And we also have our stores uh, up there, the uh, the RLM Gear Store and the RLM Amazon Store. So bear all those in mind, and thanks once again for being a part of RealLibertyMedia.com. Dot com. Frumpy! There's Frumpy joining in. All right. <laughs> All right, let's do it. I got a bunch of stories lined up. Uh, they're odd stories, but then aren't they always odd stories? Yes, they are. All right. So we're starting off on the New York Post uh, from January 21st here. So uh, not quite a month ago. All right. European Space Agency facility makes oxygen 
out of moon dust. Hmm. Yeah, according to this, humans, humans, people like you, are headed back to the moon. That much is abundantly clear as NASA, the European Space Agency, China, and others have announced plans to send humans to Earth's tiny neighbor. Or at least they're talking about it. Exciting times lie ahead for sure. But there's a lot of work to be done before Earthlings can actually set up shop and establish a presence on the lunar surface. One of the more interesting things about setting up a lunar base is the possibility of using the moon's own resources rather than astronauts having to haul everything with them during their trip. To that end, the European Space Agency has set up what it describes as a prototype oxygen plant that will work on producing oxygen using simulated lunar material. Yeah, that's a problem to me. You're using simulated lunar material. You're using it on Earth. You have you have no there's no way of knowing this is going to work. However, the potential benefits of being able to generate oxygen on site on the moon uh, during the moon mission are many. First off, you have to actually go to the moon, which you know, people say you some people say you went there and that's that's a questionable thing to begin with. But oxygen isn't just used to create breathable air for astronauts, but it's also a vital ingredient for the production of fuel, which means the possibility of launching missions deeper into space and using the moon as a jumping-off point. Of course, that's kind of like instead of leaving from your front door, uh, leaving from your driveway. It's not, I mean, we're not talking about a long distance from Earth there. <laughs> Having our own facility allows us to focus on oxygen production, measuring it with a mass spectrometer as it is extracted from the regolith simulant. Regolith. Uh, Beth Lomax of the University of Glasgow said in a statement, being able to acquire oxygen from resources found on the moon would obviously be hugely useful for future lunar settlers Settlers, we're talking, uh, both for breathing and in the local production of rocket fuel. Going forward, producing oxygen, water, and rocket fuel on the moon would be vital if groups like NASA and the ESA want lunar bases to be sustainable over long periods of time. There's still a lot of work to be done, you think? But we're certainly getting there. Yeah, I question that. <laughs> I, I say, you know, if they've actually been to the moon, or if they actually have figured out a way to get there the first time, and say they're going back, um, you know, I, 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 I <laughs> anyway, there's that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, are they are they full of it, or are they not? I guess that remains to be seen. If they could do a better job of faking it than they than they had before. Now this next story, which also came out on January 21st over on RT.com, Russia Today, is near and dear to my heart, and probably to most of yours. Uh, whether you're a male or a female, I would imagine that breasts hold a fond something for you. <laughs> because if you're a male, you're probably interested in seeing and touching and all that things with those. But if you're a female, then you have some, and you probably like them where they're at. And you, uh, whatever. <laughs> so this article came out. <laughs> My first thought reading the headline was, Duh! <laughs> You really need to study that, but here it is. Evidence of puberty, store of fatty goodness, or the construct of the patriarchy. Scientists probe why men are so obsessed with breasts. Because they're breasts. <laughs> you really, you really. 
Oh, man. All right, anyway, Peter Andrews is an Irish science journalist and writer based in London. He has a background in life sciences and graduated from the University of Glasgow with a degree in genetics. Male preference for women's permanently swollen globular breasts. Permanently swollen globular breasts. There's a mouthful. Uh, not, yeah. Uh, is somewhat anomalous. But to date, no widely accepted evolutionary explanation has been offered. What is the latest is his, in this titillating area of research, well, let me just say this about breasts. Because they are a hidden, taboo type of thing, um, uh, that that gives them, okay, you get every now and then, or maybe more often for some of y'all, maybe regularly, uh, you get a peek at what's behind the curtain. And and so if they were out there, I mean, if, if women walked around all the time with their boobies hanging out, it, there might be less of a mystery there going on. Uh, but but as a, some wise old guy once said, once you've seen one breast, you want to see the rest of them. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> So, science has always been concerned with the big questions. How did we get here? How did the universe begin? What is the nature of reality? And now, the scientific method has turned its dispassionate gaze towards that eternal and pressing question. Why do men like women's breasts? <laughs> because they do! Or... Because they're nice, were not acceptable answers here. Neither, for that matter, is because media portrayals brainwash them into liking breasts. No, that's, that's not it. Men like breasts long before media was portraying them. If you believe this, you have to have a conversation. In science, we must seek always to be disinterested and unbiased, and to apply the principles of discovery as rigorously as we can, unless, of course, you're a climate scientist, which means no data or facts required. But we're not talking about climate here. We're talking about breasts. That is how a recent column in Psychology Today by Dr. Robert D. Martin, a distinguished anthropologist, treated his topic. So let us examine the evidence, and please let us have no giggling or smart comments from the back of the room. <laughs> breastology breastology <laughs> there's a science of breasts breastology <laughs> although the reason for breasts existence is obviously breastfeeding women's capacity for milk production is not associated with breast size at least not before pregnancy furthermore there has been no clear association between hormone levels and breast size. So why have men evolved to like them? I I'm going to say this, and I, I have no evidence or proof of this matter, but I'm going to say this. It's not that men have evolved to like them. I guarantee you, cavemen, in their caves, with their cave women, liked those women's breasts. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, an early hypothesis was that breasts are an honest signal of fat reserves, fat reserves, which would come in handy during lean times for our hunter-gatherer ancestors. If that were true, however, men should find breasts no more erotic than fat elsewhere on the body. Cross that one off. One of the most popular theories has to do with pair bonding. Neurology studies have proven that women are flooded with oxytocin, the bonding hormone. When their nipples are stimulated by a nursing baby or indeed by a sexual partner, so men who pay extra attention to this will impress their mate to make it more likely she will have his babies, or at least 
go through the actions and not have the babies. Um, make of this theory what you will. It seems to suggest an unlikely degree of selfishness in men. Not an unlikely degree at all. It seems like a natural degree of selfishness in men. But there are, but there may be something to the bonding aspect. Switching positions. One person who thinks the bonding plays a part is British anthropologist Edward Dutton. He has suggested that breasts evolved into resembling buttocks. Uh, seeing as our distant ancestors mated from behind, and how do you know that? Like our primate cousins. <laughs> all doggy all the time. Well, at some point, they, they must have switched to face to face. This moment in evolutionary history was hugely important because with front-facing intercourse came sustained and intense eye contact, theretofore absent from the act of procreation. Oh, come on. You don't know how they were doing it. <laughs> Much has been speculated about the profound anthropological change face-to-face -face sex may have brought on the human species, not least at the new depths of pair bonding it must have triggered. Uh, Dutton thinks that one of the byproducts of the change may have been that female breasts expanded so as to create cleavage, reminiscent of the previously all-important backside. How old are you? How old are you? Uh, possibly the most intriguing argument is that of evolutionary psychologist Frank Barlow. His nubility hypothesis, or as the Strangler sang, bring on the nubiles, uh, proposes that full, pert breasts are an honest signal of youth and therefore fertility. In the ancestral environment, humans often went without clothing on their torsos, meaning the female breasts would have been more on show. Before birth records, and possibly even before the advent of language, there was no way to know the age of the other adult humans except by visual physiological signals. As women age, gravity takes over, and their breasts begin to sag. Therefore, fleshy lumps on females' chests become one full, foolproof way for males to know uh, the rough age of females, even if it was subconscious. Over the aeons of time and thousands of generations, those men with an internal urge to mate with women with younger breasts would on average have greater reproductive success seeing as they were mating with younger but adult, if they point that out here, younger but adult women. How do they know they were adult? You're talking Stone Age. <laughs> anyway... So I I don't know where where uh, why they uh, went ahead and did this. I mean it seems like a pretty simple thing uh, as to why do men like breasts? Yes, George Carlin point, uh, Rob works points out was the wise man who once said once you've seen one breast you want to see them all. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now you know. I don't like to talk about politics on this show, or any show, or at all in life. I just don't like politics. I don't care about politics. But I saw the title of this, this article, probably on Twitter. It could have been on Minds. I, I don't know where I saw it. And my, my first thought was this big double-handed flip-off to this piece of dirt, this piece of crap. Joe Biden says... Game developers are little creeps who teach people how to kill. Go straight to hell, Joe creepy-ass Biden. A recent interview reveals presidential hopeful's position on game creators. Yeah, the ex-vice president and presidential hopeful Biden recently made the suggestion that video game creators teach people how to kill in an interview with the New York Times. Biden also referred to video game creators as little creeps during a conversation about big tech. Suck it. Just really, I, I, I need nothing more from you. Nothing more of this 
this article here, which was posted on nationalfile.com on January 21st. Um, just eat crap. Just suck it, man. I hate this guy, this Biden. He is a horrible, horrible human being. He's got no idea what he's even talking about. And he goes out there and he, and, he, and he starts dissing these guys that are probably 20 times smarter than he is, uh, these game developers. And who knows? I mean, he's, he, he is a piece of shit. That's it. I mean, he could go straight to hell, man. I, I just, ah, oh, what a terrible human being. It just, just, bleh. Anyway, that's all. That's all about that. Biden, suck me. <laughs> I got nothing good to say about that guy. <laughs> uh, he, that guy is calling people little creeps. What does what, what he think he is? Oh, man. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. ActivistPost.com, January 21st. I'm here in this little town. I'm here in this little town. And I'm safe. I'm safe from those those big spy agencies. Those NSA guys. All those other government agencies. Right? <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Not so much. Um, the DEA's National License Plate Reader Network expands to smaller cities. Bear in mind. Keep that in mind. Who is it that's doing it? It's it's not it's not the even the TSA. It's not the Department of Transportation. It's not the NSA. It's the DEA. The DEA are out there reading people's license plates, and now they're coming to towns like mine. Last week, the Herald publication in Mascouta, Illinois revealed that the city of Fairview Heights entered into an agreement with the IDOT to install automatic license plate readers, ALPRs, on highway trusses to allegedly prevent, deter, and solve crimes, which is typically government doublespeak to explain away Big Brother tracking innocent motorists. Taken at face value, Fairview Heights' reasons for tracking everyone is nothing new. They use the same cookie-cutter excuses that law enforcement across the country have been using. But what really caught my eye was the other resolution approved by the council. The other resolution calls for the city to belong to the DEA's National License Plate Reader Network, the NL NLPRN. Yeah, the, D the agreement with the DEA allows Fairview Heights Police to both input data into the national system and retrieve data from it, along with establishing processes for sharing and use of such information. How does capturing personal information of everyone driving through or into Fairview Heights prevent or deter crimes? Fairview Heights Police officers can input data into the national system and retrieve the data from it, along with establishing the processes for sharing and use of such information. The same agreement further specifies that information obtained through the NLPRN can only be used for the investigation of uh, dr trafficking offen drug trafficking offenses. Okay, you're, you're driving through. They know nothing about you. How are they getting information about drug trafficking offenses with you driving through? Oh, but also money laundering, other crimes, amber alerts, silver alerts, and in furtherance of the mission of a traffic stop. The mission of a traffic stop. What? <laughs> but those are not the only things law enforcement uses them for. Of course not. The Fairview Heights Police Department and other agencies are helping the DEA expand their 343 million license plate database. Five years ago, people were outraged to learn the DEA had created this license plate database, database 
And the past year, private ALPR companies have created a list of license plates that makes a DEA database look utterly laughable. Combined, these ALRP, ALPR companies have created a list of more than 14 billion license plates that track everyone's movement across the country over many years. Illinois law enforcement and other agencies have created a statewide vehicle surveillance sharing network. As far as further plans go, Chief of Police Chris Locke said that things are advanced to the point that the IDOT trunking system can be used to make connections under the state highway when the time comes to add more to the system. There's more to the story, but do you really need it? Do you really need it? <laughs> now they're talking about sex here in the chat. Okay. <laughs> now they're talking about sex. Oh, what am I missing out on all the good stuff? <laughs> all right. Moving along. <laughs> Oh man. Now this this is specific to one to one small sector. This is posted on UPI dot uh but dot, dot com on under their top news section on uh, January twenty second. But it, it it's specific to one small sector of the corporate world. But it could apply very, very widely. Of course they're not going after those that are their friends. But they are going after these guys. And we've seen them going after other ones before. British watchdog finds guitar maker Fender $5.9 million for price fixing. A British watchdog fined the famous guitar company Fender nearly $6 million Wednesday over charges of price fixing. The British Competition and Markets Authority said Fender Europe, the subsidiary of the Arizona-based Fender, forced vendors to sell guitars at or above the minimum price between 2013 and 2018 and, a limit, and limited online discounts for customers. This kind of illegal practice, known as resale price maintenance, often leads to customers missing out on the best deals because... Even when they shop around, they find all retailers tend to be selling at a similar price. The CMA found evidence that Fender, on occasion, pressured retailers to raise their online prices after being tipped off that they were not towing the line. The, the fine part, uh, the fine, is part of an effort by the European Competition Agency to crack down on price fixing, electronic company Casio was foreign, fined 4.9 million last August re related to pricing for its digital pianos and keyboards. And Philips, Pioneer, Aces, Denon were fined by the European Commission on similar accusations. Uh, quite simply, this behavior is against the law, uh, CMA CEO Andre Caselli said. The fact that CMA has imposed larger fines on major musical instrument firms, Casio and Fender, in a matter of months should be a lesson to this industry and other companies considering I illegal behavior. Well, I notice you're not going after Big Pharma, uh, Big Agra, uh, uh, Big Oil. You're not, you're not going after Big Oil. Let's go, let's just go to that one. Because all the various oil companies, they have a group. It's a cartel. It's called OPEC. And they get together to do what? Fix prices. I notice you're not going after the London Gold Fix, which is called a fix, and for a very good reason, is every day they get together to fix the price of precious metals. <laughs> they fix the price. That's their job, is fixing the price. <laughs> so if you're friends of, of these people... You're just fine, but if you're not, uh, they, they, they're going to come after you because, well, hell, 
They could make five million dollars, six million dollars off you real quick and easy. Uh, all right. Now I I don't know. I, I, I know they say in in the article where it comes from. Uh, although the article is posted on popularresistance.org, which I really know nothing about. Um, uh, but I gotta believe it's like this mega mega left wing um, liberal site, uh, they, and they pull the article uh, from Andrea Germanos on on Common Dreams, which is a well known uh, to me anyway uh, left leading, extremely left leading site. So so when I saw the headline, I was like, oh my god! But we gotta cover it anyway, uh, and, and this was posted up there on January twenty first as well. <laughs> Global poll finds majority believe capitalism more harmful than good. And I will give them a slight bit of credit uh, for this. Um, uh, they're talking about a photo uh, that they have in the header of this here uh, about capitalism. Uh, anyway, and, and the photo says, according to a new global survey, 56% of respondents agreed with the statement, capitalism, as it exists today, does more harm than good in the world. Johnny White. Now, I will agree that capitalism, as it exists today, it's not even capitalism. It's not capitalism at all. It's corporatism. It's fascism, but people call it capitalism, and that's not what we got. <laughs> that's not what we got at all. Anyway, the majority also said they believe they will not be better off five years from now. I have to agree with you on that one, too. The global survey out Monday ahead of the World Economic Forum Summit in Davos showed that over half of the respondents believe capitalism in its current form, does more harm than good. Well, that, glad that settled in, mused one Twitter user. The findings of the 2019 Edelman Trust Barometer, which polled over 34,000 respondents in 28 markets, uh, to measure its trust in government, business, NGOs, and media. Uh-huh. <laughs> 56% of respondents said they agree with the statement, capitalism as it exists today does more harm than good in the world. See, the, the only, the way to fix capitalism, the way, the way, the way to fix capitalism is to remove government from capitalism, which you're not going to do. <laughs> so, so instead of removing government from capitalism, really way to, to restore Capitalism, a true market capitalism, a less fair capitalism, is to remove government completely and totally, 100%, from all aspects of everything. Then you'll have true free market, lousy fair capitalism. And when you have that, people do well. With what we have now, certain people do well, and the rest of you suffer under the regulations that are forced through what you believe is a representative government onto you by their big corporate buddies. <laughs> you think you think your government's just writing these laws and passing them. No, they're being written for them. And those laws are being shoved through. And lots of money is changing hands. And that way they, they keep they get they eliminate all competition or at least the, the greatest bulk of competition. And if what you d you design something brand new, if it becomes popular, it gets it gets co-opted almost immediately. Anyway, that belief was expressed by a majority across age, uh gender and income levels divides. Uh in fact, there were six just six markets where the majority of respondents did not agree. Tell me if you recognize these. Australia, Canada, the United States, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Japan. Yes, indeed. 
Rothschilds, bank, central banksters, countries, one and all. The strongest support for this statement was found in Thailand, 75%, and the lowest level in Japan at 35%. In the United States, just 47% agreed with the statement. And those those 47 actually do need a little education because when they put in there as it exists now, uh, then they're correct. I, I don't know if it does more harm than good, but it's certainly not good. It's not capitalism. Uh, the survey also found that 48% of respondents believe the system is failing them, while 18% believe it is working for them. <laughs> All right, and, and Kate points out, yeah, this is that's called or or uh, also called crony capitalism, yeah. So, um, uh, capitalism needs to be pure, and and we have anything but pure capitalism. Uh, so that that could be fixed, and that would certainly make things better um, for everybody, for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So let me ask you. How old are you? Do you go to church? And how old are you? Well, this one particular church in uh, Minnesota, Cottage Grove, Minnesota, <laughs> says if you're too old, if you're like 50 or older, don't even come to our church. We don't want you old farts coming to our church. <laughs> Struggling church. Oh, this is on uh, WSBTV.com, by the way, posted on uh, January 21st. Struggling church asks congregation to stay away. Oh, aging congregation. Not just the whole congregation. The aging congregation. To stay away in hopes of attracting young families. You old farts, you're on a limited income. We don't want you in here. <laughs> Members of the congregation at a Methodist church in Cottage Grove, Minnesota, are upset that their church is asking them to stay away for two years so it might appeal to younger people. Grove United Methodist Church will be closing in June, but plans to relaunch in November. Current members, most over 60 years old, will be asked to go straight to somewhere else to do their worshiping because, according to the uh, uh, St. Paul Pioneer Press, officials from the church said the congregation needs a reset and the best way is appeal to appeal to younger people. The church has struggled with membership and finances, Seven years ago, the church could no longer pay for its minister, so it switched to a lay minister with weekly sermons by members. The church's attendance and finances have stabilized recently with an average attendance of 25. You got the same 25 people coming there week after week, these old folks, and, and they're not giving as much as you think they ought to, I guess. And then you're telling them, well, go away. We don't want you here. <laughs> I pray for this church getting through this age discrimination thing. William Gaxetter said at a church at church on a recent Sunday as the gray haired heads around him nodded in agreement. This is totally wrong. They are discriminating us because of our age, said Gaxetter's wife, Cheryl. The Reverend Dan Wetterstrom, Wetterstrom, head of the two-location Grove Church, said in a memo that the church could die unless something changes. Yeah, well, the Methodist regional body is paying $250,000 to restart the church, Wetterstrom said. They have hired a specialist in starting new churches. 30-year-old Jeremy Peters, who moved to the area with his wife and two children for the real... So they're going to be doing, like, rap or... Rap, rap hymns? <laughs> I don't know. It's a new thing with a new mission, with a new target for a new culture, he said. The older members will not be physically barred from attending. They won't, like, beat them down with a bouncer or something. But the expectation is that they won't. 
We're asking them to let this happen, Wetterstrom said. For this, for this to be a truly new, we can't have the core group of 30 people. The members of the church have other options. They could come to Woodbury during this phase. Four members can reapply, or former members can reapply. Wait, 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 wait. You have to be a member? You have to apply to the Grove Methodist Church in two years? Former members can reapply. What? You have to apply to go to a church? That's the first time I ever heard that before. <laughs> Wait, no, no, you, we, we did not accept your application to come to our church. <laughs> you, you, uh, you didn't say enough Hail Marys or what? I, I don't know. Oh man. <laughs> ah. Let me get a sip of water before I start this article. Mmm. That there is some clean, pure water. Goes through my filter after it comes out of my tap. And I put it in these bottles and I drink it that way. Yeah, yeah, that's some clean, 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 pure water. On theguardian.com, posted January 22nd, U.S. drinking water contamination with forever chemicals, far worse than scientists thought. Highest levels of PFAs in the Miami, Philadelphia, and New Orleans a uh, report by the Environmental Watchdog Finds. The contamination of U.S. drinking water with man-made forever chemicals is far worse than previously, previously estimated with some of the highest levels found in Miami, Philadelphia, and New Orleans, said a report on Wednesday by an Environmental Watchdog group. The chemicals resistant to breaking down in the environment are known as perfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAs. Uh, some have been linked to cancers, liver damage, low birth weight, and other health problems. The findings here by the Environmental Working Group, EWG, show the group's previous estimate in 2018, based on unpublished U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, data, that 110 million Americans may be contaminated with PFAs, could be way, way too low. Terrible estimate. It's nearly impossible to avoid contaminated drinking water from these chemicals, said David Andrews, a senior scientist at EWG and co-author of the report. The chemicals were used in products like Teflon and Scotchgard and firefighting foam. Some are used in a variety of other products in industrial processes, and their replacements also pose risks. Of tap water samples taken by EWG from 44 sites in 31 states and Washington, D.C., only one location, Meridian, Mississippi, which relies on a 700-foot-deep well, had no detectable PFAs. Only Seattle and Tuscaloosa, Alabama, had levels below one part per trillion, the limit EWG recommends. The EWG recommends, but the EPA allows far more. Uh, in addition, EWG found on average six to seven PFA compounds were found at the tested sites, and the effects on the health of the mixtures are little understood. Everyone's really exposed to the toxic soup of these PFA chemicals. Uh, uh, in 34 places where the EWG tests found PFAs, contamination had not been publicly reported, by the EPA or state environmental agencies. The EPA has known since at least 2001 about the problem of PFAs in drinking water, but has so far failed to set up an enforceable nationwide legal limit. The EPA said early last year it would begin the process to set limits on two of the chemicals, PFOA and PFOS. PFOA, which is also found in your Teflon cooking pans, by the way. 
The EPA said it has helped states and communities address PFAs, PFAS, and that it is working to put limits on the two main chemicals, but did it not give a timeline. In 2018, a draft report from the Office of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services said the risk level for exposure to the chemicals should be up to 10 times lower than the 70 parts per trillion threshold the EPA recommends. So there you got two various government agencies disagreeing. The EPA says 70 parts per trillion, and the, the uh, Health and Human Services said it should be 10 times lower, or 7 parts per trillion, while the Environmental Working Group says 1 part per trillion. The White House and the EPA had tried to stop the report from being published. <laughs> now let me just say, uh, out here in Moriarty, uh, we, uh, we get uh, once a year, which is uh, obviously inadequate, um, but once a year we do get, which most of you may not get, um, uh, we, we get a report about the, all the various contaminants in the water. Now, our water comes from an aquifer, which is underground, and we're out here in a big valley, so we're not getting the PFOs, PFOS, and PFAs. So... But what we do get is a lot of other stuff, a lot of, a lot of chemicals um, that come naturally from the ground. Uh, one of the biggest one is arsenic, uh, and there is also the natural fluoride, and then the uh, processing plant, the uh, water processing plant, adds chlorine or chloramine, which is actually much worse than chlorine, but that's another story. Uh, either way, uh, I've been filtering my water pretty much since I moved in here, uh, because the stuff that's in that water i i don't want to be drinking in every day i drink a lot of water and um so i, I use it it's, it's a it's a countertop uh drinking water filter needs to be replaced every couple of years or so costs about 100 bucks uh, i buy them from uh, crystal quest uh, which you can find those them on amazon or or the crystal quest website um just go there and uh and and, and get some but uh you should really regardless of where you're living, have some kind of a good filter. My filter also filters out fluoride because I don't want to be drinking fluoride. Uh, I, I still get whatever amount of fluoride from the water as I'm brushing my teeth or soaked into my skin through my shower. I do have a shower filter that takes out stuff, but it doesn't take out the fluoride there. Uh, either way, uh, you should really look at getting some kind of a filter. Uh, it, if it's a whole house filter, you're covered from uh, stem to stern, I guess, as the saying goes. But if you get uh, individual ones um, for your water, for where you're getting your drinking water from and cooking water, that's especially important. And it doesn't have to be a Crystal Quest. It's just I like them. I've been using them for a long lot of years now, and uh, they work very well. Um, uh, you can certainly get there. There's all kinds of different water filters out there, and I'm not going to sit here and recommend any to you, but... Uh, yeah, um, consider a filter if you do not already have one. Now, as many of you know here, I drink almond milk exclusively, pretty much almond milk. Um, I said not pretty much exclusively. I, I when I go to the grocery store, I buy almond milk. I buy like four of those half gallon things at a time, and it lasts me. Um, for a good long time. Do I have a link to the one quart stainless steel? I what I use it's not a stainless steel bottle, Vinny. It's a copper vessel. It's basically a copper bottle, but it's a it's an Ayurvedic. Uh, Vinny's asking me about a, a one quart stainless steel bottle. It's a it's Ayurvedic uh, drinking water bottle. I'll get you the link after the show if you really want it. Uh, yeah, but those are good. Uh, um, I use that. I fill that Ayurvedic bottle up twice a day, uh, once in the morning with baking soda, with a teaspoon of baking soda in there, and once in the evening. So I drink a lot of water out of that. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's a good thing to have. Uh, but uh, yeah, you still want the water that you're putting in there to be filtered, uh, even though it is copper and it will kill all all the various bacteria and such things. Um, so. Uh, Cowboy Tech is pointing out Zero was the best pitcher filter in tests from Natural News. 
Uh, and I would look into the connections that Zero has with Natural News. And I have a little trust issue there with Zero. Um, I mean, not with Zero, with, uh, with Natural News. Mike Adams kind of creeps me out a little bit. <laughs> but either way, it's probably a good picture. Uh, and, and it's got to be better than the Brita. You don't want the Britas. The Britas are really crap. I, I know they're the most popular one out there, but yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyway, moving on to drinking substances, liquid substances. <laughs> so I, I drink almond milk. I don't drink soy milk. I don't drink rice milk. I don't drink cow milk or any of the other offshoot milks. Although I have tried hemp milk, and I did really like hemp milk. It's just harder to find. I would probably drink more hemp milk than almond milk if it was more available. Um, so there's very various other ones out there, um, but I, I stick to the almond milk. I'm used to it, I like it, and, and I know the stuff that I get is good, and it doesn't have any of the bad ingredient that a lot of the larger companies put in there. Anyway, I bring you that because I'm bringing you this, and this is an old article from October uh, 2015, but still valid. <laughs> Globalhealingcenter.com The dangers of drinking cow's milk. Cow's milk. Due to the extreme processes that milk goes through and the high amounts of antibiotics, hormones, and genetically modified substances that a cows are continually exposed to, I believe there are real and eminent concerns associated with drinking milk from cows. All cows release toxins through their milk, as milk is a natural exit portal for substances that the body cannot use. Ingredients added to cow's milk intentionally. A veritable hormone cocktail, including pituitary, steroid, hypothalamic, thyroid hormones. Remember, most cow cows are extremely stressed. Gastrointestinal peptides, nerve and epidermal growth factors, and the growth inhibitors, uh, MDGI and MAF. RBGH, this is a huge one. Recombinant bovine growth hormone. A genet and you can buy milk that specifically says not uh, from cows without the RBGH. And if you're going to continue to drink cow's milk, I would certainly suggest that. A genetically engineered hormone directly linked to breast, colon, and prostate cancer. This is injected into cows to increase their milk production. Well, you know, sock puppet, um, although I do have that typical, normal, maybe a little bit more than normal, male obsession with female breasts, I have never tried um, one that was producing milk. But, yeah, I, you know. I, I <laughs> All right. The one that really got me off milk is this next one. Pus. Pus. You know, the stuff that comes oozing out of your scabs after they've festered for a while? Pus. National average show that at least 322 million cell counts of pus per glass. This is well above the human limit for pus intake. My limit is zero. I don't want any pus. <laughs> and has been directly linked to the paratuberculosis bacteria as well as Crohn's disease. The pus comes from infected udders on the cows known as mastitis. Blood cells. The USDA allows up to 1.5 million white blood cells per millimeter of commonly sold milk. Or milliliter, not millimeter. Milliliter. So a tiny amount of milk, you're allowed to have 1.5 million white blood cells. Yes, you are drinking cow's blood in the milk, and the USDA says, okay with us, antibiotics. Currently, cows are in such a state of disease and mistreatment that they are continually being injected with antibiotic medicines and rubbed down with chemical-laden ointments to deal with their chronic infections. Currently, regulating uh, committees only tests for four of the 85 drugs in dairy cows. 
This means the other 81 drugs in cow's milk are coming directly into your glasses and your bodies. Estimates show that 38% of the milk in the United States is contaminated with sulfa drugs or other antibiotics. According to the study by the Center for Science in the Public Interest and published in the Wall Street Journal on December 29, 1989, a study from the FDA data showed that over half the, of all milk was laden with traces of pharmaceuticals, yet nothing has been done to control this. All right, they go on talking about how it affects the cows and how to avoid dangers related to cow's milk. Quit drinking it! <laughs> Stay off of it! This guy who wrote this article, also his favorite is hemp milk. And again, hemp milk is not easy to find. Um, but if you could find hemp milk, it, it'll be reasonably priced. Um, so yeah, just don't don't drink that cow milk crap. Um, <laughs> it's just yeah. But if you're getting butter, if you're getting cheese, and other things that are made with cow milk. Uh, look for the ones that tell you that they're they do not have that growth hormone in them. That that's the that's the worst crap. That RBGH, the recombinant bovine growth hormone. Stay away from that. All right, and finally, lastly, and depending on who you are, maybe not leastly. <laughs> From CNET.com on January 18th. Posted by this girl, Allison D Denisco Rayom. Your sex tech devices. You have sex tech devices? Why don't you tell me about those? Your sex tech devices may be spying on you. Some makers of connected sex devices take security seriously. What about the others? Now, let me just tell you, to me, I would assume if you purchase a a um, sexual toy of some sort of another, sexual gratification device, and it's connected via some method to the interwebs, they are monitoring that and tracking it and, and getting all your information. Why would you want that? Why would you possibly want that? All right. <laughs> Sex Tech took over CES in Las Vegas last week with vibrators, Kegel, Kegel trainers, and even a Band-Aid-esque patch to prevent premature ejaculation on display. Some of you may need that. You know who you are. Almost all of these devices connect to apps and many collect data. But what happens when sex tech or apps that power them get hacked? This year, more than 20 billion connected devices will be installed worldwide, including sex tech products with apps that monitor orgasms, save vibration patterns, or let you connect with your long-distance partner's pleasure gadget. So you could have web, internet, web sex, toy thing that they're controlling, I guess. All right, since most operate over a Bluetooth connection and with an app, breaches are possible and even likely. Uh, the good news, some established vendors in the sex tech space are taking security seriously. Eh, at least they're trying to or saying they are. There are consequences to inaction. A high-profile lawsuit in 2016 accused sex text company WeVibe, WeVibe, <laughs> of transmitting user preferences, usage data, and email addresses to its server without consent. The company settled the $3.75 million case in 2017. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't have time to go through this, the rest of this here with you. Just, just bear in mind, you're, um, whatever it is, whatever gadget, Goober, Goober, are you listening? That sex doll of yours, that sex doll you got, <laughs> maybe t telling on you, telling what your quirks and kinks are. 
<laughs> oh, man. So just be careful out there with your technical devices connected to the interwebs. <laughs> All right, folks, that's going to wrap it up here on the Grim Leftovers program for another show. We'll be back next week. I think that'll be episode 60. So, yeah, getting up there. Um, tomorrow, 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 tomorrow is In a Perfect World with Flash and Grams. I do believe I heard Grams correctly on Saturday's Dork Table saying she would be here for tomorrow. And possibly Rob Works would be joining them. So it could be a three-person perfect world show. Uh, check the schedule there at reallibertybeauty.com for all of the rest of the shows that come up throughout the week. Thanks to everybody once again for all your donations and participation and just being part of reallibertymedia.com. Y'all have a great night and a great week. Peace.